Good afternoon. The committee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Few places have felt the devastating effects of the coronavirus more deeply than America's nursing homes. More than 200,000 Americans living in nursing homes and other long-term care facilities have died from the coronavirus, representing 20% of all coronavirus deaths in our nation. The outside risks to, her, to nursing home residents and workers became evident in the earliest days of the crisis. The first major coronavirus outbreak in the United States occurred in the Life Care Center of Kirkland, Washington in February 2020, where the virus infected more than two-thirds of the facility's residents and dozens of staff, resulting in loss of nearly 40 lives. The ferocity with which the coronavirus swept through our nation's nursing homes in 2020 exposed vulnerabilities that have been building for years. For too many nursing homes had inadequate staffing and poor infection control viruses well before the pandemic. These long-standing problems helped to drive outbreaks and exacerbated the risks for Americans who need long-term care. Compounding these problems, Americans at greatest risk were left behind by our leaders when the virus hit our shows. The Trump administration's failure to heed early warnings left nursing home workers and residents ill-prepared. They refused to take steps necessary to curtail the spread of the virus before vaccines were developed, leaving nursing homes without testing and personal protective equipment necessary to detect and prevent outbreaks. New documents obtained by the Select Subcommittee and released today paint a devastating picture of conditions inside large for-profit nursing homes across the country during these crucial early months of the pandemic. In reports to hotlines run by nursing home chains, residents, their loved ones, and staff members describe the dire conditions they were experiencing during that terrible time. At one facility in Texas, a caller reported that employees were forced to make isolation gowns out of disposable bags that were, quote, stapled and taped together. At another home in the Midwest, a caller stated that employees had to wear the same disposable masks for seven days in a row. Examples of the reports we received are illustrated here. I think we all should be able to see this. Multiple reports from facilities around the country described severe staff shortages with one family member commenting that, and this is a quote, criminal for there to be so few staff members present. These new documents also shed light on the pressure that was placed on nursing home staff. An employee at a Maryland, Maryland facility who was experiencing coronavirus symptom, symptoms was reportedly told that, if they would, that they would be fired if they did not come to work. At another nursing home in Colorado, a manager pressured employees to come to work even if they feel bad and have concerns that they may be sick with COVID-19. Fortunately, our nation has come a long way since these dark days. Life-saving vaccines and treatments have helped to save countless lives among nursing home residents and staff. 
The Biden-Harris administration has prioritized protecting the health of Americans in long-term care facilities. In addition to conducting an historic vaccination campaign and dramatically increasing the supply of tests and PPE, the administration has sought to institute important reforms, such as minimum staffing requirements and measures to reduce crowding inside nursing homes. While the heightened risks that existed in 2020 have passed, risks to nursing home residents and staff will remain. We must take further steps to address longstanding challenges in this industry. We must increase the uptake of boosters among residents and staff to make sure that they stay protected against new coronavirus variants. We must ensure that nursing home workers receive adequate pay and benefits, such as paid sick leave, which is, a cru which is crucial for the health and safety of residents as it is for staff. We must also improve oversight and transparency in the nursing home industry to give residents and their loved ones the ability to make informed decisions about their care. I would like to thank all our witnesses for testifying today. I look forward to hearing more about the challenges facing our nation's nursing homes and the changes that are needed to fix these long-standing problems so that our nation's nursing homes are safe places for those who, those who need care. Before yielding to the ranking member, I ask unanimous consent uh, that Representative Stefanik be allowed to participate in today's hearings. Without objection, so ordered. I now recognize the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate you having this hearing, and thank you for the unanimous consent request uh, to allow Ms. Stefanik to participate as well. I really want to thank our witnesses for coming, and we look forward to hearing your testimony as well. Uh, I'll keep my remarks brief to allow for a short video that I'll be playing from uh, Ms. Janice Dean. Uh, she and her family were affected in the worst way by the deadly nursing home policies that were put in place by a handful of governors at the beginning of this pandemic. Uh, she's been very outspoken talking about and trying to highlight this issue. She's obviously got some very emotional feelings about this that she'll share. Uh, it is incredibly sad, though, that what we've seen in this past year plus is a refusal to acknowledge the deadly mistakes that were made and subsequently covered up by certain governors in nursing homes. We've highlighted this over and over again. We've called for hearings on what happened to get more transparency. We still to this day can't get some of that information. But uh, we've seen thousands, tens of thousands of preventable deaths that happened because some governors gave orders, and we've highlighted these mandates over and over again by specifically five governors who seemed to all almost cookie cutter take the same order over and over again uh, to go against the science, to go against the, the CDC and the CMS guidance for how to properly take care of nursing home patients in the nursing home setting. If you go back when the Trump administration wrote numerous documents uh, to protect the elderly, to protect the vulnerable, especially in nursing homes, and I've included some comments from CDC, from CMS, uh, where they talked about things like limiting vid visitors, increasing protective equipment, and strengthening the quarantine guidelines in nursing homes especially. Uh, clearly, some of the states that I referenced ignored that, went against the science. Despite the, the cover-ups that we've seen, here's what we do know. Completely ignoring the CDC and CMS scientific recommendations that positive patients not be admitted back into nursing homes without the availability of proper care, multiple governors 
mandated that COVID positive patients, in fact, be admitted or readmitted to the nursing home setting, despite the fact, in some cases, that they knew they were COVID positive. In fact, if you read the governor of New York's mandate, and again, the state of New York, like in most states, the state is the regulator of nursing homes. I'll just read from the advisory. March 25th, 2020, mandate from New York to all nursing homes, quote, no resident shall be denied readmission or admission to the nursing home solely based on a confirmed or suspected diagnosis of COVID-19. Nursing homes are prohibited from requiring a hospitalized resident who is determined medically stable to be tested for COVID-19 prior to admit, admission or readmission. Again, going against the science that CMS and CDC laid out, the, the regulator, not just New York, but then it was almost cookie cutter, cut and pasted by the governor of New Jersey. We saw the governor of Michigan do the same thing. The governor of Pennsylvania and the governor of California all gave mandates very similarly saying that you had to, as a nursing home, take patients back, even if they were COVID positive, and prohibited them from testing for COVID. And should anybody be shocked of the results we saw? Tens of thousands of patients died who never should have died. These orders were in direct conflict with the science. We saw it with Governor Cuomo. He actively and multiple times covered up the total number of COVID-19 nursing home deaths by not reporting those nursing home residents that died in hospitals. Governor Cuomo and his team engaged in a cover-up that was designed to deceive the public and protect the governor's image and personal profits from a multi-million dollar book deal. He had millions of reasons to cover up the truth. No wonder Governor Cuomo refused our request to testify. We asked him to testify at this very hearing and he still to this day has not even responded. Surely he's not here, he's not participating, but he didn't even feel he owed those victims a response to the questions we had for him. I continue to be shocked that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have largely ignored this scandal. Why is excessive and preventable death in nursing homes being made a partisan political issue? The Democrat majority has consistently used this pandemic as a political tool to divide Americans and it has caused great harm and led to more distrust in public health. With that, Mr. Chairman, I would like to show the video from Ms. Janice Dean because it does give some more insight into what happened specifically. If you could run that. Chairman Clyburn, Ranking Member Scalise, and members of the Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Crisis. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person today, but I do appreciate this opportunity to provide a statement about the horrific, preventable tragedy yeah, that affected my family and thousands of others in New York State. On March 25, 2020, the former governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo, along with his former health commissioner, Howard Zucker, signed an executive order that would put a Category 5 disaster into the homes where our most vulnerable lived. None of us knew that in 46 days, over 9,000 COVID-positive patients would be admitted into their residences. As the deceased were packed into body bags and piled up in storage trucks, Andrew Cuomo and his administration did everything they could to cover it up. I began my advocacy in May of 2020 on behalf of my husband's parents, who both died of COVID, which they contracted in their separate elder care facilities. I needed to find out the truth as to why our seniors were put at such grave risk. Instead of being remorseful or empathetic to our losses, I was attacked and belittled, scorned for where I work, who I might have voted for, and what I did for a living. But even a weather lady knows that putting sick patients into a nursing home is a disaster waiting to happen. Part of my job as a broadcast meteorologist is to make sure when there's a potentially deadly hurricane or a tornado outbreak, there's a dire warning in advance of those who are at risk. That's a big responsibility I take very seriously. Andrew Cuomo knew early on that our seniors were the most susceptible to the virus, and yet he said several times that if COVID got into nursing homes, it would spread like, quote, fire through dry grass. 
And yet neither his administration or the New York Department of Health ever alerted susceptible family members or help evacuate the residents in harm's way. Instead, they helped light the match and spread the flames. And now, over two years later, we still don't know why thousands of COVID patients were admitted into nursing homes instead of the other facilities provided by the federal government, such as the USS Comfort or the Jacob Javits Center. There were many options. So why did Andrew Cuomo give blanket immunity to nursing home operators days after issuing his executive order? And why did he try so hard to cover up the thousands of deaths afterwards? Did it have anything to do with his $5.2 million book he was trying to sell to the highest bidder? A closer look at the timeline and the money trail might give you some clues. But the only way we do that is by doing a thorough investigation and one that involves subpoenas. We need to treat what happened inside nursing homes as a catastrophic event, one that could have been avoided and was made worse by the people who were supposed to protect us. A situation like this should warrant an after action review. We must find out what happened and how we can withstand another storm like this in the future. Because if we don't find out now, it will happen again. Our families deserve answers and we won't give up until there is justice for the thousands of precious lives that were engulfed in flames from a COVID wildfire. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank Ms. Dean. And my thoughts and prayers continue to be with Ms. Dean, with all the other family members who had loved ones who were lost during that period. We will continue, Mr. Chairman, to press for the answers. Why were these orders by the regulators of those nursing homes sent out mandating that they do something that went against the very science that was coming out from CDC and CMS, explaining in detail how to keep seniors safe when we knew the data was there showing this is how to keep seniors safe. They went the opposite direction and forced those nursing homes to take COVID positive patients, banning them from testing the people that were coming back into the homes and tens of thousands of people died unnecessarily. We will continue pressing for those answers. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Scalise. I would like to welcome today's witnesses. Uh, Dr. Alice Bonner has been a nurse practitioner caring for older adults and their families for over 30 years. Dr. Bonner is currently the Senior Advisor for Aging at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement the chair of the Moving Forward Nursing Home Quality Coalition and an adjunct faculty member at the Johns Hopkins University School of Nursing. Dr. David Grabowski is a professor of healthcare policy at Harvard Medical School, where he studies long-term care and post-acute care. He is a current member of the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission and previously served on the CMS Nursing Home Coronavirus Commission. Dr. Grabowski has appeared before Congress numerous times in the past, including at a briefing of the Select Subcommittee in June 2020. Ms. Adelina Ramos is a certified nursing assistant who has worked in nursing homes for 11 years. As a staff member at the Greenville Nursing Center in Greenville, Rhode Island, she worked on the front lines of the pandemic, including heroically uh, providing care for dozens of critical Ill, pa Ill patients during the early months of the coronavirus pandemic. Dr. Jasmine Travers is an assistant professor of nursing at NYU Rory Rock Myers College of Nursing. Her current work focuses on mitigating health disparities in long-term care for older adults. Dr. Travers is a primary care nurse practitioner and has published widely on the topics of aging, long-term care, health disparities, and workforce diversity. Mr. Daniel Arbini is a principal 
at executive search at the executive search firm CMF Partners. Mr. Arbini's father, Norman, passed away during the early months of the pandemic while living in a nursing home. Mr. Arbini, please accept our sincere condolences for your loss. Will the witnesses please rise and raise your right hands? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? You may be seated. Let the record show that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Without objection, your written statements will be made part of the record. Dr. Bonner, you are recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Chairman Clyburn, Ranking Member Scalise, <clears throat> members of the House Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus, Representative Stefanik and others, thank you for the opportunity to speak today on behalf of the Moving Forward Nursing Home Quality Coalition. We are a growing coalition of more than 200 action-oriented leaders and organizations that have come together this year to create action plans for effective and sustainable improvements that will be delivered in the near future. I'm here today because each and every one of us cares deeply and is committed to improving quality of life for individuals living in nursing homes in the United States. We have submitted a letter to the subcommittee on behalf of the coalition that outlines six ways that Congress can begin taking meaningful steps to improve nursing home quality. It's not an all-inclusive list and not all the proposals can be done right away. Some will require more time. We urge Congress to work alongside us to take action so that all nursing home residents receive the care and support they deserve. Nearly 1.3 million people live in our nation's 15,000 plus nursing homes, as you know, and another 1.5 million work in them. The coronavirus pandemic has brought an intensified sense of urgency to addressing long-standing issues of inadequate care and support. The Moving Forward Coalition is committed to improving quality by building on strong research, clinical expertise, tested models, and advocacy for sustainable improvements. The Moving Forward Coalition's approach is different from some other groups. Our purpose is to develop, test, and promote a set of step-by-step -step action plans that can be implemented based on the recommendations in the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine report that was released in April of 2022. The coalition began this past July and has established seven committees, each focused on key priorities. Over 200 individuals and organizations, including nursing home residents, workers, policymakers, advocates, and others, have joined the coalition in just a few months, and that number continues to grow every week. NASEM report recommendations are well aligned with critical needs described in the White House's February 2022 fact sheet on protecting seniors and people with disabilities. Both documents clearly convey a sense of urgency to address growing gaps in care and support that were brought into sharp focus during the pandemic, as well as they cite best practices. Every person deserves safe, high-quality, age-friendly care and support throughout their life, and the people who dedicate their professional lives to that work for whom it is a calling or the work I was meant to do, they also need the resources, compensation, training, and support to deliver that care. I began my professional working with older adults when I was 19 years old and got a job as a nurse's aide in a nursing home when I was still in college. And I proudly wear the name badge that says nurse's aide because that experience led me to a lifelong career in nursing homes because I was inspired by what was possible and what the nurses and nursing assistants did to create a positive, supportive, loving home. I've seen how hard many nursing home teams work to provide quality care and support for older people, often under challenges such as COVID. However, I've also been in nursing homes in which care falls short of meeting basic human needs, such as getting help to go to the bathroom or getting a bath or a shower even once a week. Over 85% of nursing home residents need assistance with one or more activities of daily living, and yet many of them are not receiving that care consistently. 
That must change and must change as soon as possible. While we have federal and state regulations designed to set standards for nursing home quality, those regulations may not be fully enforced in all cases by inspectors or state surveyors. We need a regulatory framework that reinforces and rewards quality. We need to ensure that what matters to residents is part of the culture in every nursing home. All nursing homes need to be quality homes. The Moving Forward Coalition is off to a strong start. Our committees are holding their first calls or meetings this month, and we look forward to sharing action plans with this, this subcommittee back in, uh, in early 2023 on the work that's beginning now. Nursing homes are a part of the health care system that's often overlooked. The Moving Forward Coalition is bringing individuals and organizations together to raise expectations about what is possible. We urge Congress to lead the way toward a future of nursing homes full of the humanity and grace that all of us want and deserve. We offer the Moving Forward Coalition as a leader eager to work with Congress, state and federal agencies and others to improve nursing home quality now and in the future. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Bonner. We'll now hear from Dr. Grablowski. You are now recognized for five minutes. Great, thank you. Chairman Clyburn, Ranking Member Scalise, and distinguished members of the House Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Crisis, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on this important topic. I am here today speaking in my capacity as a professor of healthcare policy at Harvard Medical School who has studied nursing home quality for 25 years. Residents, their families, and their caregivers have long known that U.S. nursing home care is broken. Yet this issue has gone largely unnoticed in the broader population. COVID changed this. As one family member recently stated, the pandemic has lifted the veil on what has been an invisible social ill for decades. COVID completely devastated nursing homes in the U.S. There have been over 1.2 million COVID cases among residents, leading to roughly 172,000 COVID-related fatalities. Over 2,600 nursing home staff members have died from COVID, making nursing home worker the most dangerous job in America. Not surprisingly, both resident census and staff employment levels are still down by over 10% relative to their pre-pandemic levels. A key question in directing policy resources is determining what factors were associated with COVID outbreaks in nursing homes. In a systematic review of 36 peer-reviewed studies, our research team concluded that COVID outbreaks were largely a function of where you were located versus who you were as a facility. This does not suggest there was nothing that could have been done to prevent COVID outbreaks. Rather, it suggests that policymakers needed to adopt a system-level approach to address this problem. It is not too late. There are several short-run and long-run reforms that can support nursing home residents and their caregivers. In the short term, I would encourage policymakers to focus on two areas, increasing vaccination levels and improving staffing. First, it is time to extend the initial federal vaccine mandate for nursing home staff to include booster doses. Roughly half of all staff are not fully vaccinated. Second, to ensure all residents and staff have access to a vaccine clinic, I would recommend federally supported clinics for any facility with low booster vaccine rates for staff and residents. Short-term steps to improve nursing home staffing include introducing a federal minimum staffing standard, increasing staff pay and benefits, providing opportunities for career advancement, and creating a better work environment. In the longer run, the recent National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine Committee on which I served concluded that the way in which the United States finances and regulates care in nursing home settings is ineffective, inefficient, fragmented, and unsustainable. To create a more rational approach to financing nursing home care that would address these significant shortcomings, the National Academy's report included a recommendation about moving towards a federal long-term care benefit by studying how to design such a benefit and then implementing state demonstration programs to test the model prior to national implementation. To ensure adequate investment in caring for long-stay nursing home residents, our study committee recommended the use of detailed and accurate financial information to ensure payments are adequate to cover comprehensive nursing home care. 
We also recommended the designation of a specific share of Medicare and Medicaid payments go towards direct care services as opposed to non-care costs such as lease payments. And we also recommended the increased use of value-based uh, nursing home payment models to reward facilities for providing better quality. In terms of regulatory reforms, the National Academies Committee provided recommendations to ensure state survey agencies have adequate resources, and we made additional re recommendations for the oversight of state survey performance. In terms of increasing financial and ownership transparency, we recommended collecting, auditing, and making detailed facility-level data on the finances, operation, and ownership of all nursing homes publicly available in real time in a readily usable database that allows for the assessment of quality by a common owner or management company. In summary, the pandemic has indeed lifted the veil on nursing home care in America. We have an incredible opportunity right now to address problems that we have, we have ignored for far too long. I look forward to working with the members of this subcommittee on this effort. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Grebowski. We will now hear from Ms. Ramos. Ms. Ramos, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Claren, Ranking Member Scalise, and the members of the committee for inviting me to speak today. My name is Adelina Ramos. I'm a certified nurse assistant at a nursing home in Greenville, Rhode Island. I'm also a proud member of SCIU 1199 New England. Like so many facilities across the country, we were not prepared for COVID. Our facility already had issues and COVID made everything worse. When COVID first hit, three or four residents in my facility died each week. A CNA at my facility was, was one of the first nursing home workers to die of COVID in Rhode Island. In May of 2020, I got the news that I've been dreaded for so long. I had COVID. I did everything I could not to catch the virus but the conditions were so bad at my facility, it was impossible to avoid. It didn't have to be like this. We needed personal protective equipment. We needed more training to keep ourselves and residents safe. We needed more staff. We plead with the management, but nothing changed. Mother's Day 2020 really broke my heart. One of my residents was slipping away and her children could not see her. And um, she wanted me to sit with her but I couldn't because I was caring for 25 other residents. There was only a nurse, another CNA, and a housekeeper on that shift that day. Most of those residents couldn't eat, drink, get out of bed, or go to the bathroom without help. They all required oxygen change every 15 minutes. We regularly have to make impossible choices about which residents to help first. Do I go to the resident sit in a soil bed? Or do I go to a resident who fell and is asking for help? What if it happened, the fall happens while I'm toileting another resident? Russian can only cause more harm. Our residents, families trust us to care for their loved ones. I can't describe how painful it feels when we are forced to make those kinds of choices. Today I'm vaccinated. The vaccine and I'm vaccinated, the vaccine and the boosters have made a huge difference. We can care for our residents better and they're not as scared of the virus. However, the crisis in our nursing homes is far from over. We continue to face severe staffing shortage. CNAs are burnt out, mentally, physically. Our pay is so low that some of us have to work two or three jobs. Nursing home staff leave, leave the workforce for agencies because they pay higher. Residents want care from people they know and trust. They can get the right, <clears throat> I'm sorry, they can get that right now at my facility because the turnover in agency staff is in and out. We never know who will be there on a given day if there will be enough staff. Residents are disappointed and frustrated. Some ask me, why can we have more staff? And why can they pay more? I also want to say that this isn't about CNAs. Every single nursing home job is essential. Housekeepers, maintenance workers, nursing homes, I mean nurses, dietary workers, aides, and activities workers. All together to give residents the best care possible and the best quality of life. 
the majority of nursing home workers are women and people of color, and we often called unskilled and uneducated. Our jobs are de devalued. It's disgraceful. After two and a half years of a daily pandemic, we're still treated this way. We are fed up with the lack of respect nursing home owners and lawmakers show our workforce. Change needs to happen now. One way we can do <clears throat> that is through unions. Our unions have secured additional sick leave and better health insurance. We want guidelines to ensure that we have safe staffing levels more often. A union contract means management has to follow the rules. It means workers have a seat at the table. And it means we can't fight for our residents to have, a, to have a better care. But not every nursing home has a union and the workers the, and the residents are suffering. I'm here today again representing the thousands of nursing home workers are, who are still fighting for what we deserve. Congress has the power to set standards in all nursing homes. You have the power to hold nursing home owners accountable and make sure that public dollars are used to improve care and care jobs, not increase profits. We will need quality care at some, we all will need a quality care at some point of our lives. And that can only happen with a skilled, strong workforce that is respected, protected, paid, and staffed. On behalf of all nursing homes workers and our residents, please take an action. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ramos. We will now hear from Mr. Arbeni. Mr. Arbeni, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Claiborne, Ranking Member Scalise, and members of the Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus. My name is Daniel Arbeni, and I live on Amity Street in Brooklyn, New York. In one week in April, I had four family members die, my father, my uncle, my two close cousins of the virus. Three of them were in nursing homes. It was, we reluctantly at that time joined the 100,000 other New Yorkers in the New York, what we call the New York COVID nursing home orphans. There were a lot of people. Thank you for very much for hearing this and I appreciate the opportunity to speak about our personal family experience. The GAO testimony last year pointed out that while nursing home residents are less than 1% of the population, at that time, they were nearly 30% of the COVID deaths. Thank you, Chairman, for uh, pointing out it's now 20%. Those are the ones that we're supposed to love, honor, and protect. And we failed, we failed miserably. No family should go through this, and we all went through it, and many here lived it on the other side. In New York State, the critical component was the March 25th directive, compelling nursing homes to accept COVID possible positive patients. My family has lived on the same block for five generations in Brooklyn. It's a wonderful heritage we were given, but more importantly, it is where my family has deep community roots. My father was a vivacious 88-year-old man, still working and driving with a very sharp mind and a quick smile. He sat on the stoop of the house, always offering a smile, a helping hand, and a greeting to everybody regardless. In short, my dad was in rehab to get strong. Right around the corner, from his window, he saw the rehab center. And was COVID-free up until the time of the Governor's March 25th order. It was the nursing home who actually came to us and told us about the order and how Cuomo and the State Health Commissioner refused to listen and, and just ignored their pleas. They even came up with options for the state, all ignored. Excellent options, mind you. Despite 24-hour care, um, we brought our father home, gave him 24-hour care, a week later he passed away. We took a COVID test 12 hours before. He died 12 hours later, 12 hours after that, approximately. We got the COVID positive test. Even non-medical personnel, we knew it was senseless to state government to exercise the, full, the fullness of its powers to compel people with a highly contagious disease, a killing machine at the time into nursing homes where the weakest and most vulnerable were confined, 
What could they possibly be thinking? We, we, my brother and I, we talked about this, my family, our friends, those similarly situated like us. Then, then the state legislator agreed with the governor and gave blanket immunity to everybody. At that point, our family decided we're going to find the truth and that's what we're gonna focus on and meaningfully help those like us. Thankfully, the media began to focus on the Cobble Hill Health Center, our local nursing home. Why? Because New York State had asked all the nursing homes what were the number of probable deaths from COVID. One out of over 600 nursing homes answered truthfully. Five, 10, 15, our nursing home said 55. Well, the media, thankfully, descended on them. They were the canary in the coal mine. They truthfully answered. They truthfully answered, and the media were trying to skewer them. We spent hours speaking to every outlet you can imagine, AP, Wall Street Journal, CNN, to show them what was happening. And in the end, each one of them realized that it had nothing to do with the nursing homes in New York. They were forced into this, and they had no idea about the March 25th order, the PPE shortages in the nursing homes that the state was ignoring. On October 18th, we held a mock funeral for our governor's leadership and integrity, which focused on two simple things, an apology and the true death toll. That came about because he was writing a book on his leadership and he had just published it. October, six months later, Despite the fact that COVID being a virus knows no political party, he blamed it on politics. Based on how, what we know today, every statistic New York State used was misleading. Rather than using facts to point us to the truth, the guardians of the public interest used their offices to point us away from the truth. Finally, and thankfully, on January 2021, the state attorney generally, general announced a bombshell report that the debts were undercounted, and so were the readmissions. Speaking for myself, almost every other family and every other family member in this situation, we still have not accomplished our goal of learning the truth. And I'm here before you to hope that you can help us accomplish that. No one in public or private sector is admitting their culpability for the debt, distress, pain, and suffering that, caused, that was caused and concealed. For this reason, we welcome the attention of this committee on the nursing home aspect of this American tragedy and urge further oversight and help. Thank you. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Dr. Travers for five minutes. Chairman Clyburn, ranking member Scalise, and members of the Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus, crisis. Thank you for this invitation to speak today on workforce issues, equity, and disparities. Several issues are inherent to the nursing home workforce with many rooted in structural inequities. These inequities present as staffing shortages, inadequate pay and benefits, lack of advancement opportunities, and poor working conditions. Certified nursing assistants, CNAs, bear the brunt. When asked about the biggest challenge affecting nursing homes' day-to-day -day operations, administrators often mention insufficient staffing. Proposed minimum staffing hours have been defined, yet these levels are rarely met. Nursing homes not meeting hours have higher Medicaid census and proportions of black residents, for profit ownership, and located in severely deprived neighborhoods and rural settings. Staff shortages have severe consequences for resident safety, quality of care, and job satisfaction. CNAs have reported being responsible for more than 20 to 30 residents simultaneously, creating heavy workloads and unhealthy working conditions. Insufficient staffing can result from the inability for homes to recruit and retain staff and not scheduling enough staff. Such challenges center around stigma toward nursing home work, including the type of work, pay, and workload. Often staff receive less pay than peers working in other settings, such as hospitals, or even in other industries where the work is less demanding. Lastly, funding the care of older adults has often been deprioritized in deference to child care, critical care, and other specialties. Staffing interventions must address these issues. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, hereafter referred to as CMS, intends to propose a minimum staffing standard next year. CMS is collecting information and opinions from staff, residents, and families. 
vital for the success of a minimum staffing standard is supplying more funding. As it stands, CMS is pushing states to use their Medicaid funding to improve nursing home funding and tie increases to accountability efforts, such as quality measures and higher staff wages. However, CMS must do more than encourage state action. A strong commitment is needed to improve the working conditions and environment related to education and training, compensation and benefits, opportunities, empowerment, and treatment through mandates, incentives, and accountability efforts, along with temporary support such as strike teams. It is important to highlight the systemic inequities that have perpetuated disparities among nursing home residents. Homes with any black residents experience significantly more COVID infections and deaths than homes with no black residents. Beyond the pandemic, when compared to their white counterparts, black and Latino residents are likelier to experience pressure ulcers, falls, and under treatment for pain, ordered antipsychotics and restraints, and less likely to receive preventative care. Residents who identify as LGBTQ plus or living with dementia often do not receive required care because of limited staff knowledge and training on how to care for these groups along with biases. Failure to hire staff that is culturally congruent to residents results in inequitable care experiences when residents' cultural and linguistic preferences are, met, are unmet. To that end, all older adults deserve equitable care. Several recommendations in the National Academies report speak to this. First, identify care preferences and implement and monitor corresponding care plans. Second, ensure nursing homes are accountable for the total cost of care and poor care delivery through alternative payment models. Third, require staff participation in ongoing diversity, equity, and inclusion training. Fourth, prioritize models that reduce disparities and strengthen connections to communities and broader healthcare systems. Lastly, develop a health equity strategy for nursing homes. This is important to know what additional work is needed and where. Finally, I want to emphasize the importance of combining policies, data, and experience to truly appreciate the consequences of decreased oversight, support, and accountability. During the pandemic, CMS waived inspection requirements outside of infection control. Thus, citations for deficiencies such as odor and care planning were ignored. Visiting homes, my nose would sting from the pungent smells of urine and feces. Sheets were heavily soiled and residents were severely unkempt. Pleas among residents for simple requests such as going outside just to feel the sun on their faces were constant yet unaddressed. While such, such, well, such, while such citations may seem unimportant, they lead to poor quality of care such as falls, pressure ulcers, infections, depression, and avoidable hospitalizations and deaths. We must consider the lives that were lost for these reasons and approach such waivers more meaningfully in the future. In conclusion, I urge the subcommittee to recognize that older adults do not want to stop living, although they might need help living. Only then will we be able to start to make meaningful change necessary to improve nursing home care staff for our, nursing home care for our staff, residents, and families. And I just want to recognize Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, who re represents NYU. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Travis. Uh, each member will now have five minutes uh, for questions. The chair now recognizes himself for five minutes. Uh, thanks to the Biden and Harris administration's historic vaccination campaign, 87% of nursing home residents and 89% of staff have been vaccinated against the coronavirus. These tremendous vaccination rates helped to curtail the devastation that we saw in nursing homes in 2020. Ms. Ramos, you worked on the front lines of the coronavirus pandemic as a certified nursing assistant at a nursing home in Rhode Island, you've testified today that um, you've had personal experiences that I would like for you to tell us what you think has been the impact uh, of this coronavirus on your life and the lives of the residents you cared for. Thank you, Senator, for the question. So on 2020 was the worst day I've ever experienced in my whole life. When we first got um, a resident that was sick with the virus. Um, I were, at that time, I was working on a dementia unit, which means that those residents couldn't tell us like their symptoms, how they were feeling. Um, we, 
our residents were fallen, and then that's when um, we find out they were very weak and sick. Um, and at that time, that's when we kind of figured like they were again sick, and then they were trying to test them and to make sure they had the virus. Um, but for us, the staff, they weren't testing us at that time. So we had to go out on our own, and if we had the symptoms, to test ourselves. The facility wasn't doing that. And also, we didn't have enough PPE at the facility. Um, they, we were told we had to use um, the same mask for several days, and uh, we have to reuse the gowns. And we also told them what we were trained in infection, or if you have any virus, we're supposed to change our PPE. And we were told that they didn't have enough. So since the facility that I work at, we have a, a union. Um, we had to call our union organizer and complain the situation that was going on at the facility, that some staff are having the symptoms and they were not testing them and they were going out on their own and get tested and then that we didn't have enough PPE. So our union had to um, bring us extra PPE and also um, they had to call the state to come in and test us. That's how they send in the National Guard and that's when I find out I was asymptomatic and I found out that I was positive when the state came in. Can you tell me, did the um, vaccine, once the vaccine came, was there, what was the um, extent of the change? So when we finally got the vaccine, I was actually one of the first ones in the group with my other colleagues that decided to go first because a lot of our colleagues weren't sure about the vaccine. They were kind of um, afraid of the symptoms and they were afraid that they have to lose time from work. And um, so our, again, our union had to make sure and work, like, work with the management and told them that we're doing that for the best care of our residents and that we shouldn't be losing a pay if we get to symptoms. So after we got the vaccine, our coworkers saw that, you know, we were doing better with the um, symptoms weren't that bad. So, um, and also our residents, some of our residents were very excited that we had a vaccine and they were excited to get the vaccine. So um, they went and I got the vaccine. So after we got the vaccine, our residents and our staff members um, were very excited and also our residents didn't die on the rate they were dying previously. So we probably had um, three, like one to two residents that died from COVID for the past year. Um, before the vaccine, we lost like 20 plus residents at my facility. Well, thank you very much. I guess I'm almost out of time. I'll now you uh, to the ranking member. Uh, thank the chairman again, uh, and appreciated all of the, the witnesses' testimonies. Um, as we covered in the beginning, we saw pretty early off in, in the pandemic, uh, as the CDC and CMS were putting out guidance, and specifically for nursing homes, they were making it very clear that a nursing home shouldn't be taking patients if they didn't have a plan to keep COVID positive patients separated. Yet, in fact, you saw New York through Governor Cuomo start issuing that order that ultimately then other states followed. We saw New Jersey come right behind it, almost verbatim. And, and I'll read the New York guidance because it was then used by New Jersey, Michigan, California, Pennsylvania, went forward and well as well. And this is quote from the mandate from Governor Cuomo's health department. No resident shall be denied readmission or admission to the nursing home solely based on a confirmed or suspected diagnosis of COVID-19. Nursing homes are prohibited from requiring a hospitalized resident who is determined medically stable to be tested for COVID-19 prior to admission or readmission. So there you had the governor of New York saying, if you're a nursing home and there is a patient coming from a hospital possibly COVID positive back into your nursing home and you're not prepared to take care of that patient, you still have to take them going against guidance from CDC and even further, more egregious, you are banned from testing them for COVID. 
And of course, New York is the regulator of the nursing homes. And so, Mr. Arbini, in your testimony, you pointed out that the nursing homes saw this. They saw what was going on with COVID, the deaths that were happening, especially in the most vulnerable populations. And they knew this could be a huge problem, but their regulators telling them, you got to do something that actually could undermine the health of your own residents. And they pleaded with the governor not to do this. Uh, if you can expand on that, what did you hear from the guy? Have you gotten a response from the governor? Because we surely haven't. And we've asked time and time again for the same numbers you're talking about. But if you could share, because that had to be a really a frightening experience to be told by your regulator, you have to do something that you know could lead to the deaths of the very people you're there to protect. Thank you. It, it was, we knew at the time what was happening um, at the hospitals, which were struggling too with staffing, and we knew what was happening at our nursing home. And when they came to us and said, you can take better care of your father at home because you're engaged, uh, you need to take him home, it was, it was like a hurricane. I, I have no other way to describe how my family and I all got together and came up with a plan. The hospital had left some medical needs alone. They weren't doing anything unless it was life-threatening, so we had to get those taken care of. It was, we were in a race for our lives and we knew it, and we did everything in our power to get him home. And at the same time, we were going out and we made a donation. My family led a group uh, donating to our local police station and twice to our local nursing home of thousands of people Piece, excuse me, pieces of PPE, because we saw with our own eyes what was happening to our loved ones. We saw what was happening to our police. They had nothing. So our city knew, our state knew what was happening, and they ignored it. Their focus was the hospital. And did you get any reaction from Governor Cuomo or his office that they were, I mean, obviously they're being told this could be deadly. Did they even care? Did they do anything differently? No, they did nothing differently. Our local elected officials sent emails, called. We had a fully functional ICU hospital one block from our house, one and a half blocks from the nursing home. They were, please use that building. It's the perfect building. Negative pressure rooms built specifically for this. Governor Cuomo would not use it. Well, let me come back to that. I, I wanted to ask Dr. Grabowski because it seems like you've done some research. There are some pretty riveting numbers that you talked about, not only nursing home deaths, but especially, you know, 2,600 people who worked in nursing homes. Is, is, it wasn't just the nursing home families. Like you said, 100,000 family, uh, families who were part of this, this orphan class now you're talking about, but those workers. Uh, were you aware of these mandates from the regulators, the states like New York, who said you have to take them back and you can't test them for COVID? So we didn't study those directly in our research. We took a much more uh, national focus, but certainly I've since then heard a lot about the difference. Does it sound like that followed CDC guidance to force them to do something that CDC was telling them not to do? Yeah, so I, I didn't sort of get into that in my, my research at the time. We we didn't focus a lot on kind of the New York and the timing of when CDC was releasing that guidance. So I, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't be the right person All to right. comment Mr. on that. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back, but uh, Mr. Arbini and every other family out there, we are not gonna stop fighting to get those answers. Even if Governor Cuomo and others wanna keep hiding the facts, we are gonna dig until we get the answers to those questions. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Scalise. The chair now recognizes Ms. Maloney for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for, for calling this important hearing. Uh, paid sick leave for nursing home workers allow staff to take care of themselves and their families and to keep residents safe. Uh, but shockingly, many nursing homes do not offer paid sick leave to workers at all. This uh, puts many staff in an impossible situation, particularly during outbreaks of infectious diseases like the coronavirus. Uh, Dr. Bonner, what impact does the lack of paid sick leave have on the health and well-being of both nursing home staff and the residents they care for? Mr. Bonner. Thank you uh, for the question. So I think 
uh, it's significant that in nursing homes, uh, not only things like lack of paid sick leave, but other benefits may drive people to um, you know, come to work even when they are not feeling well, even when they are, um, you know, they have sick children or sick older adults at home. Um, and so, you know, this is, has been identified in some of the studies that our, our colleagues have uh, talked about today as, you know, one of the factors that may have led to spread of the coronavirus uh, crisis more rapidly in you know, organizations like nursing homes. Um, so there are over 500,000 CNAs who work in nursing homes and uh, many other professionals. And again, they, they felt a sense of duty to be there to, um, to take care of residents. Uh, and so the lack of paid sick leave also, many of the people who are nursing home workers are single parents. Uh, they've got children at home, they've got bills to pay. And so, um, you know, without any paid sick leave, this was thought to be one of the uh, challenges during the pandemic. Well, thank you. Ms. Ramos, I understand that you have been caring for nursing home residents throughout the pandemic and that the facility where you work does provide, provide paid sick leave to you and your colleagues. How has paid leave helped you and your coworkers do your jobs effectively during, during the pandemic? Ms. Ramos. Thank you for your question. So our facility does have sick leave. That's because it says in our union contract that um, we accumulate sick leave through uh, the bargain that we did. And also we have a state sick, sick leave that's like separate from our contract. But at the beginning of the pandemic, we were also told that um, we had to use our sick times when we were, got COVID from work. So um, our union had to uh, work with the management and negotiate with the management saying to them, they got sick from work and they shouldn't be using their sick time to pay for them to be out because they got COVID from work. So what uh, ended up happening was, is that our union finally talked to the uh, management and they come up with, if we got COVID from work, we will go through uh, work and scomp. And so that's how we got paid and uh, we were uh, homesick. And then whenever we got better, that's when we went back to work. And, but for a lot of workers that are not, that are non-union facilities, I've heard from some of my friends that um, they had to go to work sick because or else they will lose their jobs, they were told. And some of them were actually sick at work until they couldn't be sick anymore. You know, they couldn't take it anymore. And they um, had to be out, but they were not getting paid. And, um, and I felt bad for one of my friends when she told me that what was happening. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Nursing home workers, many of whom are women and people of color, are strong, also struggle with low pay and have high poverty rates. According to a 2022 report by PHI, a leading authority on the direct care workforce, 12% of nursing assistants working in nursing homes live in a household below the federal poverty line and 34% rely on some form of public assistance. This is not just an economic issue, it's a real life consequence for nursing home residents. Dr. Grubaki, how does low pay for nursing home workers create risk for nursing home residents in addition to the staff? Thanks, thanks for that question. Uh, our nurse staff are heroes. We didn't treat them or pay them like heroes before the pandemic, and we, and we certainly didn't treat them and pay them like heroes during the pandemic. Uh, when we underpay staff, they leave these positions. There's huge uh, staff turnover at these facilities, uh, leading to gaps in care, discontinuities in care that leads to uh, bad outcomes for our residents. The best thing that we can do for our residents is support our staff, and that means paying them well, uh, giving them strong benefits like uh, Ms. Ramos just described with uh, paid sick leave, and uh, really making it a job worth having. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank My you. time has expired. I yield back. Thank you very much. The chair this is Mr. Jordan okay. for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Grabowski, was it a bat to a pangolin to a hippopotamus to Joe Rogan and Aaron Rodgers, or did COVID start in a lab? 
Dr. Fauci and Dr. Collins say it's the former. They said it was animal to human. Some of the virologists who they've given our tax dollars to over the years uh, have said the same, although initially, I think it's interesting to point out, before they had their conference call with Dr. Fauci and Dr. Collins on February the 2nd, on January 31st, 2020, Dr. Christian Anderson, who's received a number of our tax dollars over the years, said virus looks engineered, virus not consistent with evolutionary theory. Dr. Gary said it's easy to do this in a lab. They, of course, changed their position after they had this famous conference call with Dr. Collins and Dr. Fauci. I was just wondering what you think. Did it start in a lab or was it from a bat to a pangolin to a person? So I, I'm a health economist. I, my research has been focused on nursing homes, supporting staff, uh, supporting residents. You've you got that. a degree. I, from, I saw your background. You got a degree from Duke, degree from Chicago. You're professor of health care policy at Harvard. Is it, is it a good idea for the guys in charge of our government policy on this to mislead the American people? So I, I don't have an opinion on where the virus started. Just last or, week, Dr. Redfield was in, interviewed, and Dr. Redfield said this, Fauci knew he was misleading the Congress and the country. Do you agree with Dr. Redfield, or do you think Dr. Fauci was telling us the truth? One, once again, I, I don't have an opinion on this. This is sort of outside the scope of my research. When government research. said the vaccinated couldn't get the virus, were they guessing or lying? Once again, this is sort of outside the scope of what I focus on. I'm really focused on the care of our nursing home residents. Yeah, but you're, you're a smart guy. You're, you're a professor at the Harvard uh, University School of Medicine. And I'm uh, a smart guy that chooses to focus on nursing homes and really supporting those okay, well, how about and, this question? and how putting about better this? nursing home policies in place to really well, uh, provide better care for our residents and our staff. Can the vaccinated, get the, can the vaccinated get the virus? So, sorry, ask Can that the again. vaccinated get the virus? Did individuals who are vaccinated get, get COVID? Can they get it? Yeah. Sure. Sure, they can. So when the government told us that they couldn't, were they guessing or lying? Once again, that's sort of outside the scope of How about what this I've... one? Is the pandemic over? Once again, that's not for someone in my position. I'm a health economist whose research focuses on yeah, nursing but you're homes. In front of the, you're in front of the Select Committee on Coronavirus. I mean, we, we talked about the number that I think you cited, uh, Representative Scalise cited this as well. Uh, I think it was 172,000 individuals in nursing homes lost their lives. We're talking about health care policy. One of the things it seems we should be getting to the bottom of is how did this thing start? You're a witness in front of the committee with this background, educated guy, professor of health care policy at Harvard. I'm just asking you something. President of the United States seems to think the, pa the pandemic is over. I'm asking, do you think the pandemic's over? Once again, I, this is a hearing about nursing homes. I'm really focused on, on how do we support our staff and how do we support our residents. And we, that's might have had, we, might have had, we might not have had the terrible things happen in nursing homes if the government would have been square with us from the get-go. That's one of the things I think is important for the country to understand. Maybe some of these terrible things don't happen. In fact, we've had testimony in front of this committee that said if they, if they would have fo focused on the idea that this came from a lab, and I asked Dr. Girard, I said, would that have changed how we dealt with the virus and could that have saved lives? And he said, yes, it would have. So that's, that's why we're asking the question. That's why it's important to the American people. And frankly, just on a fundamental level, it's important that the government not mislead its citizens, which it obviously seems they're doing. So may, maybe I'll ask it this way now. If the pandemic's over because the president has said it just a couple days ago, and the government misled us on the origin of the virus. Seems pretty obvious they did. They definitely misled us on the, the statement that the vaccinated couldn't get it or transmit it. Uh, should people who lost their job be able to get it back? Once again, that's kind of outside the scope of kind of what I, what I research. Re recruitment levels for our military are off 40%. I just talked to colleagues on the House floor who say for the first time in their time as a member of Congress where they didn't have as many people apply to go into our uh, academies because of the vaccine, because of the vaccine mandate that's on. I'm just asking the basic question, should people, health care policy, this seems to have a bearing on overall policy, should people who lost their job be able to get it back, particularly in the United States military? So my research hasn't focused on kind of job loss in the military. That's really kind of outside the area that I study. Once again, I'm very focused on, on nursing homes, which is the focus of this hearing. How about this one? Should Pfizer, J&J, &J, Moderna have to pay uh, the, the back salary of people who lost their job, seeing how they've been misled on the, on the, on the effectiveness of this vaccine? Once again, that's not an issue that I've focused on in my research. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Foster.
for five minutes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess I'd like to start by apologizing on behalf of the U.S. Congress, uh, you know, and, and to express my admiration for your not getting lured into trying to um, talk about things which where you don't have the training or the knowledge about. As you can see, the U.S. Congress is not constrained in that way of uh, for talking about things we know nothing about. I think knowing so, where, the, where this thing started is important. Reclaiming my time, I'm, I would like to actually. At this well, point, I'm just, this is a fundamental question. This consent. is the Select Committee on Mr. Coronavirus. Jordan, the, the origin of the virus time. is an important. Reclaiming question, my Mr. time, Chairman. Mr. Jordan. I think you know that I'm not going to tolerate that. Well, no one has disrupted you. No, no, but he commented no, about uh, my my questioning, and I'm asking a fundamental question. I commented question. on my time, I'm and I will continue about to use my, my questions. Time. Correct. You can and ask whatever question no. you want. You don't have to comment about mine. And if you comment about mine, I want to raise the fundamental question. Why won't this committee Wanted, look no. into how this thing started? I'm not going to answer your question, and you aren't going to ask a question again now. I, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you very politely to obviously, recognize and obviously, respect Mr. Chairman, the gentleman's time. Obviously, the Democrats don't care about finding out how this virus that disrupted so many lives, including Mr. Abernathy's family, they don't. They don't care about finding how this. My thing family started. has been. I do, and the folks I represent. Your family. Do. Your family has been uh, uh, impacted by this, and so has mine. So let's, let's stay away from that. So I think you would like to know. How, like, I think it makes sense for you to. And I've got enough sense to started. know that we are going to do this in regular order. And the order here today is to talk about nursing homes. We are not going to get into that. You've yet to get into it in two years that we've had. Mr. Foster. Today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I also, I too lost my um, favorite aunt and my favorite uncle in a nursing home in the situation. And I just want to say that the vast majority of people working in the nursing home industry were trying to do the right thing with imperfect information. You know, it was months before we knew that this was primarily aerosol and that all of the business of sterilizing your food and super washing your hands was largely irrelevant and what was important is not to exhale in the presence of people who are vulnerable. Okay, and it took us a while to understand just how simple that was. It's also, I'm a little bit concerned that, that we're trying to focus too much on what happened in certain, there were problems all over the country. And I'd like to, at this point, ask unanimous consent to, to put into the record a list prepared by staff of other, of other states that had very similar, very significant problems. You know, Georgia, you name it, large, Connecticut, Maryland, just all over the country. Without uh, objection. Uh, my, my aunt and uncle passed away in Pennsylvania, and I thought the, the staff there were doing the best they could under terrible circumstances. And, and the way patients passed away, you know, being unable to, to um, talk to their loved ones was, was tragic and um, unfortunately necessary given what we knew about the, the virus then and, um, and what we know now, actually. And there's a lo large number of lessons to be learned. Um, one of them, too, is, as has been mentioned, the fact that we have, we have been underinvesting in end-of-life care in this country for a long time. There is enough money in our country uh, to, to solve this problem. It is not like we're asking for something that's unachievable. You know, since the start of the Obama recovery, the net worth of Americans has increased from $60 trillion to nearly $150 trillion. All right, that's a lot of money, and um, but unfortunately, not much of that increase in wealth has ended up in those in the middle class who fall out of the middle class at the end of life, because that is who ends up in nursing homes. This is not something just, you know, nursing homes are not just for minorities in, um, in areas. There's a sort of narrative about this is what nursing homes are about, and it's not. It is, um, it is ordinary middle class people who simply run out of resource at the end of their life. And we have enough money to fix this in this country, and it is to our shame that we don't. It was one of the first things I did when I was elected 12 years ago, I guess. I, I ask, what in Illinois does your life look like when you run out of assets at the end of your life? And there is a certain amount of money that we have. It's made much worse in Illinois, in fact, because Illinois, like New York, like California, a number of other states, writes an enormous check to the, to the Sun Belt and to the, the low population Western states. Um, there was, if we simply had, a, because we pay a lot more in federal taxes than we get back in federal spending. There is that alone, fixing that would provide a much better level of, of health care um, generally and particularly end-of-life care um, in states like New York and 
and Illinois and California, the, the large population states who are, are routinely brooked by, the, by formula driven spending from the U.S. Senate. That's not the subject of this hearing. Um, but it's really important when you talk about what's going on in indiv individual states is the balance of payments between the states. Um, so I'd like to just talk a little bit about, about the, the labor force shortage here. You know, there's an obvious solution to this. It is called immigration reform. Um, it, and there are, there are hordes of very competent, well-trained um, nurses around the world. Uh, and they traditionally have entered the U.S. workforce. Uh, they enter the U.S. and as they're qualifying for, to get nursing credentials, they work as ordinary nurses' assistants um, in, in elder care homes. I visited one just a few weeks ago here. Um, and, it's, um, and this is an obvious solution. And it, is, is there any, any reason that you've come to understand about why we can't fix this? Because it's all Americans who suffer from the lack of assistance. Yeah, Dr. Grabowski, any? Yeah, sure. So uh, a large share of our uh, labor force in nursing homes are immigrants currently. And I think as you're suggesting, Congressman, we could expand that. And we need to expand that going forward, especially with the aging baby boom generation. We're doing a study right now, and it fits exactly with what you're asking. Um, it turns out Areas uh, with greater immigration see uh, an increase in the workforce in, in nursing homes, and guess what? It leads to better quality. And so that link is absolutely there. We need to encourage uh, strong pathways to get more uh, immigrants in, because that's going to be a big part of the puzzle. It's not the only piece, but it's going to be a big part of it going forward. We, we cannot do this on uh, just using uh, domestic workers alone. We're going to need uh, strong immigration going forward. Okay, Thanks. thank you. My time is up, and I yield back. If you have another question, I'm going to allow it, because I think we took a minute and a half of your time listening to some foolishness, so I'm, I will allow you. Yeah, okay, okay. I guess what we talked about um, later, you know, I'm a scientist, so I look for technological solutions that will make things better. Um, and one of the things that strikes me is that there are a number, you know, diabetes is one third of our healthcare costs. And there are treatments that are now looking like they're home runs in, um, in, in treating obesity and diabetes. Uh, these are, you see them on TV, which I won't quote the trade names, we see them <laughs> all the time. And so the question, the question that I have is we've learned in COVID there are huge advantages in giving away certain things like vaccines and testing for free and that they net out as a huge savings in quality of life and, and as well as taxpayer savings. And I was wondering if, if there are ongoing ways, what is the framework for studying that and understanding if we can save the taxpayer money by, by distributing these diabetes cures, uh, you know, at, you know, for free to everyone. Sure, yeah, sounds like healthcare economics. Uh, uh, all right, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, absolutely, there's a whole uh, area of economics called value-based insurance design where you uh, lower the cost sharing, maybe even make it zero, as you suggested, for high-value uh, drugs and interventions. And this might be an example of one such uh, drug. Uh, in order to s uh, study the savings with nursing homes, you'd really want to think about uh, what are the changes in functioning that this kind of drug might, might have for nursing home residents? Remember, for most nursing home residents, Medicare is going to be paying their health care. So a lot of the savings would be on, on the Medicare side, presumably, uh, in terms of their health care spending. But uh, are, are there savings on, on the nursing home side in terms of, you know, their functioning gets better? As you mentioned, maybe obesity is lower. There's, there's all sorts of ways that uh, potentially they, they may end up costing uh, Medicaid and Medicare less in the nursing home. And that's where we'd want to focus on and see if there's any potential offset Thank there. And, and we'll be following up with you on that. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the chair now recognizes Dr. Green. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Grabowski, I'm going to be sen submitting a, a question in writing to you, but uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm yielding my time to the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Stefanik. 
Thank you, Dr. Green. Mr. Arbini, thank you so much for being here today as an advocate on behalf of so many New York families, the 100,000 uh, New York COVID orphans, essentially, for the over 10,000 lost loved ones in nursing homes. Uh, I want to start off on March 25th, when Governor Cuomo issued that fatal directive forcing nursing homes to accept COVID-positive patients. Did you consider that a death sentence for the most vulnerable in New York? nursing homes? We absolutely did, and not just myself, not just my siblings, everybody we spoke to, whether they were in nursing homes, whether they were in hospitals, we all did, and we were all dumbfounded because we all knew the USS Comfort was sailing in. I, I went with my son and my wife to see it sail in. Unfortunately, five days later, New York City had 3,000 plus beds that were never used. That's correct. The Javits Center and the USS Comfort. And the reason they weren't used was our state layered on top of the federal admission policies, their own admission policies, which I have access to. Um, and so it was never used. It was a disaster. And I've spoken with constituents in my district in New York 21 who lost their loved ones in nursing homes uh, in the North Country and upstate New York. But I want to point out, everyone knew Governor Cuomo and Lieutenant Governor Hochul's directive was not accordance to CMS guidance. Look at this. Secretary of HHS, there is no CDC guideline saying you should be taking positive COVID patients and putting them back in the community in nursing homes. Former CMS Administrator Seema Verma, under no circumstances should a hospital discharge a patient to a nursing home that is not prepared to take care of those patient needs. And then when asked directly, would New York State's guidance have violated CMS guidance, the answer was yes. This was a death sentence. And isn't it true that only four days after issuing that directive, during Andrew Cuomo's press conference, he himself said that, quote, coronavirus and a nursing home is a toxic mix and can be like, quote, fire through dry grass. Isn't it true that he said that? He said that multiple times, and I can actually get out the dates he said that. Um, it, was, it, was, it was horrific for anybody that was living through that. Yes. So Governor Cuomo knew, and they worked over time to cover this up. As families came forward, they certainly came and tried to reach the governor, tried to share their views, as well as the nursing home workers. What was the governor focused on? He was focused on winning his Emmy, which has since been taken away from him, and he was focused on cooking the books, withholding the numbers, so he could get his $5.2 million book contract, which was unethical. I will always fight for transparency and answers. My question is, since Governor Cuomo has been forced to resign, Kathy Hochul, who was the sitting lieutenant governor, she promised to fight for transparency. She lied when she said that. Can you talk about your family's experience working with other advocates, your reach, reaching out to Kathy Hochul and what she has failed to do? My brother printed this out. This is my father's death certificate, and we've showed this, we've shown this to our attorney general, our comptroller, and we gave a copy to our current governor, and she said she was mortified that she couldn't, and nobody could tell us if my father's death counted, and that she wanted to get a true death count, that we shouldn't 50 years from now be trying to figure out what happened. Unfortunately, nothing has happened, and as best we've been told uh, through somebody else that they won't be looking back, they only want to look forward. She lied, and she continues to delay any investigation. She has refused to respond to congressional outreach from myself, Ranking Member Scalise, Ranking Member Jamie Comer. Uh, isn't it true that the state Senate, which is held by Democrats, they've refused to do a fulsome investigation into this? Yes, they, they have not done an investigation with subpoena power, and they've whitewashed it. And we know this very clearly because the Attorney General in January of 2021 and our state comptroller came out with, sorry, 2022, and our state comptroller came out with uh, their findings. And I could read to you those findings. I have the quotes. Uh, but at the very highest levels in our state government, 
we were lied to for their narrative. Help is on the way. The subpoenas are coming. House Republicans are committed to standing up and demanding answers and justice for those families that our colleagues across the state, uh, across the aisle, in New York State and here, have failed to do. The subpoenas are coming. Help is on the way. I yield back. General Lady for yielding back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Raskin for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. This morning, the subcommittee released reports exposing the truly horrifying conditions in nursing homes across the country in the early months of the pandemic. And I can remember like it was yesterday how the Trump administration abandoned nursing home workers and other essential workers as they pleaded for the federal government to help them get critical supplies necessary to protect themselves on the job and curb the spread of the virus. But instead of mobilizing a serious federal response, President Trump contemptuously stated that his administration was, quote, not a shipping clerk. And he told the states to go and find their own supplies. Today, I'm actually reading about a, a new book that's been published um, quoting Melania Trump in a phone call with former New Jersey Governor Christie and in which she discussed seeking help convincing her husband to take the pandemic more seriously. You're blowing this, she recalled telling her husband, the authors, right? This is serious, it's gonna be really bad and you need to take it more seriously than you're taking it. He just dismissed her. You worry too much, she remembered him saying, forget it. The new documents demonstrate just how severely nursing home facilities were affected by PPE shortages under the dereliction of duty of the administration. So long before Donald Trump did nothing to rescue his own vice president, Mike Pence, as he was being hounded and chased out of the Capitol by Trump's mob, he was doing nothing to rescue tens of millions of Americans from the nightmare of COVID-19. Some employees were reportedly told to, quote, share PPE with other employees. Some were only given one protective face mask to wear for an entire week and were instructed to use makeshift isolation gowns out of plastic or paper bags that were, quote, stapled and taped together. Ms. Ramos, as someone who worked in a nursing home during those early months of the pandemic, how did these systemic PPE shortages affect you and the lives and work of your colleagues? Thank you for your question, Senator. So during that time, we didn't have enough PPE, like I said. Um, we were struggling to get PPE. Like, um, we didn't have, they told us to use uh, the same mask over and over again, and they told us to reuse the gowns. So we um, also had, um, they, when our staff members were getting sick, so we didn't have enough staff to work either. Um, so we were short staff at that time also. And um, during that time, we called our organizer and let them know what was going on in our facilities. And um, our organizer had to come for a rescue and bring us the PPE and also uh, tell them that they need to do something about the staffing or the management has to come in and help out because we didn't have enough staffing. Like um, on Mother's Day, I remember clear that day, um, we had 26 residents that were very sick. And one of my residents, she asked me if I could stay by her bedside and hold her hand because her children were outside the window visiting her. And it broke my heart because we didn't have enough staff on. So I was, there was only two CNAs working that day and a nurse working that day. So for 26 residents. And um, so I, it broke my heart because I told her I couldn't sit with her because I have other 25 residents that I had to care for. But um, we called the management and um, the answer was we had enough staff on. So, um, and the PPE, our organizer had to drop off some PPE. But also the short staffing, it didn't start with the pandemic. It also start before the pandemic, we had a, a big shortage of staff. So the pandemic made things worse for us in the nursing homes. Well, thank you very much for your service and also for your testimony. The previous administration's refusal or complete inability 
to do their job allowed one of the worst pandemics in history to run practically unchecked here in the United States. Dr. Grabowski, how did the Trump administration's failure to provide nursing homes with PPP and other essential health supplies affect their ability to care for residents in the first months of the pandemic? Yeah, thanks for that question. As uh, Chairman Clyburn mentioned during my introduction, I served on the Trump administration CMS Coronavirus Commission back in 2020, and we were asked to take stock of what had happened up until that point and offer a, a series of recommendations to really uh, provide nursing homes with a roadmap uh, out of uh, the, the kind of uh, crisis that they were in at the time. And our recommendations included personal protective equipment, uh, testing, support for staff like Ms. Ramos, better ventilation, and on and on and on, better data. All these issues have come up. Uh, Mr. Arbini talked about PPE and uh, more transparency of data. You know, we, we had a, a really strong list of, of recommendations. Those recommendations were not incorporated. Uh, the administration said thank you, didn't put them into practice, and I think that cost us a lot of lives at the time. Uh, Congressman, if we had went ahead and uh, really uh, provided PPE to facilities, uh, rapid testing, uh, support for our staff, and on and on and on down the list, uh, I, I think that, that death total I cited earlier would be a lot lower today. Thanks. Thank you for your testimony. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Jim, for yielding back. The Chair now recognizes Melia Tartas for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today. As a New Yorker, I'm especially um, happy to welcome Mr. Arbini for, to, here to tell his story. Um, I think we can learn a lot from you and uh, expose the decisions that were made by the Cuomo Hochul administration that ultimately led to over 17,000 of our seniors dying, and unfortunately, your father, and my condolences for that. I just want to talk about the timeline because on March 13, 2020, CDC and CMS released guidance stressing that a COVID-19 positive nursing home resident must be quarantined and properly treated. The guidance directly forbids nursing homes from accepting patients they were unable to properly treat. Then on March 15th, in a phone call between Jared Kushner and Governor Cuomo, Cuomo allegedly said, for nursing homes, this could be like fire through dry grass. He admitted that. And March 19th, the Society of Post-Acute Long-Term Care Medicine warned admitting patients with suspected or documented COVID-19 infection represents a clear and present danger to all the residents of a nursing home. So it was very clear, very well known to everyone, that the elderly were the most vulnerable to COVID and that putting positive patients in the nursing home just lacked common sense. On March 24th, it was during his daily press briefing, and it was a very famous, this video clip, where he said, my mother is not expendable, and your mother is not expendable. Um, and, and yet, the very next day is when he put out that directive, that lethal directive that mandated nursing homes, regardless of their ability to provide care, to accept the COVID-19 positive patients discharged from hospitals. And that directive prohibited the nursing homes from even testing the patients prior to admittance. And to boot, the state didn't even provide the PPE to help the nursing homes. And like you said, you were delivering PPE, so was I, going to the nursing homes to try to help them because they were forced to do this without any help from the Cuomo administration. And it was directly against the CDC and CMS guidance and common sense. Now, this is the interesting thing. Even after the governor set up and the, and the president sent in the USS Comfort Ship, uh, the, 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 the DOD set up the Javits Center on Staten Island. We had the South Beach Psych Center. Even after there were alternatives that were not full, right, hardly used really, the governor kept this mandate and kept requiring that nursing homes take that. Why do you think that is? Yes, Mr. I, I would look. Why do you think even after yeah. there were alternatives that he continued to put those positive patients in nursing homes? It, it, it's dumbfounding to me, and, and the way I'd like to answer it is I could guess, but what I'd like to do is point out some facts. Um, on March 19th, he started working with book publishers on his book, our former governor, and four months later, he all of a sudden has a book and a book deal, and he's lying about all the numbers. He called the president at the time, President Trump, and asked for help. 
President Trump set up in less than 10 days, 3,000, almost 3,000 beds. Now, 2,000 beds at the Javits Center, uh, they mobilized. And five days after March 25th-ish, they all are open. We did a FOIL request and found out on April 7th, the vice admiral in charge of those facilities was emailing the executive chamber and saying, we have nobody here, please send us. And you see the chain of emails, they're getting the runaround. Mm. I can only guess that our, our governor, who then purposely made sure no one could use the Javits Center or the USS Comfort because he layered admission policies on top of that, didn't want to do it because it might make the president look good or it might help New Yorkers. I, I can't understand how you could not do it. Now, um, I think we, we should also look into whether nursing homes got higher reimbursements than if he had put, had the state gotten more money putting people in nursing homes or hospitals versus these alternative sites. That's something that should be looked at. Um, but one question, you mentioned your father was in the, ho in the nursing home from when? When did, when did he start being in the nursing I, home? I don't remember the exact date for this, the mm -hmm. last one, but I think it was, it was around March 25th, plus or minus a couple March 25th, of so it was before the directive. Yeah, it was, it, I think it was, he was sorry, it was a week before? So he was in the nursing home a week prior to the directive. The directive happens, and you're saying in April is when your, your father was positive and passed away. And at that time, there were these alternatives set up. Correct. So you believe if the Cuomo, if Cuomo decided to put these individuals in the alternatives instead of the nursing home, your father could still be alive today? So the answer is absolutely. I'm sure staff brought the virus in. No, no one could say no to that. But putting 9,000 COVID positive patients into the nursing homes is nothing short of a death sentence for my dad and the other tens of thousands or 15,000 people. Yeah. Well, again, my condolences, and I've run out of time, but thank you for being here. Thank you. Sorry for going over. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding back. Uh, the chair now recognizes Dr. Miller-Meeks for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today. And uh, let me also say to all of those who lost loved ones uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. As a physician and a former public health director, we know that uh, infectious diseases are something that we have largely tried to, to help, to assist with, and COVID-19 uh, is one of those where we still don't even know the origins of COVID-19 and are still uncertain about transmission status with vaccination, but we know people with vaccines and boosters can still transmit the virus, so we still have some to learn but one of the things I, I can say that we do know from the infectious disease and medical standpoint is that when you mix sick people with an infectious disease with well people, that you're likely to get transmission. Uh, and as we've heard from my colleagues today, it's clear that the governors in New York, New Jersey, and Michigan violated clear guidance and infectious disease protocols by issuing must-admit orders, which sadly led to thousands of unnecessary elder deaths. We already knew uh, from the evidence we had from China uh, that there was uh, transmission in elderly people, that children rarely got ill. Uh, there was a question whether tra uh, children would transmit the virus because they have uh, a much better immune system. Uh, we knew that this group was the most susceptible group, and we already uh, knew that there was guidance from CMS uh, and from CDC in regards to admission status. Let me, let me also say that the actions of these governors went against CMS and CDC guidance when they forced COVID-19 positive residents back into nursing homes, forced them to be accepted and declined, and in sometimes actually tried to get them not to test the COVID-19 status. While the Trump administration was issuing guidance to attempt to protect the, all, this already vulnerable population, these governors showed carelessness and acted directly against the science. This is not political, it's scientific. For those of you who have children and have gone into a pediatrician's office, most pediatrician's offices will segregate out the well children from the sick children. And in fact, we did that with pathways into hospitals throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Long-term care facilities have always been more vulnerable to infection, infectious disease outbreaks for a plethora of reasons, but especially because they're primarily occupied by elderly people who have an already suppressed immune system. And this has remained true with COVID-19. However, carelessness and a lack of following the science led to worse outcomes than what was necessary. And I would say any public health director, state public health director, and I was one in Iowa, would have known that putting COVID-19 positive patients or patients who had not fully recovered from a COVID-19 diagnosis and admission to a hospital would put others at risk. When the population of caregivers are primarily younger, who may not get ill, it's possible they could bring in COVID-19 coming into a facility, but more likely introduced from ill patients who had poor immune systems and were more likely to transmit. So I believe that as we look back and conduct oversight of the COVID-19 pandemic, we should look at the importance of ensuring long-term care facilities remain a priority when it comes to allocation of resources, uh, such as PPE and vaccines for situations such as, uh, as when the pandemic arises in the future. Um, and Mr. Uh, Aberney, I think you've spoken to this, but could you speak to the risk this presents to residents of nursing homes, and can anyone provide a good explanation for the inconsistencies in how we did in hospitalizations, in hospitals, acute care hospitals, in segregating patients, and then what was allowed to be admitted and mandated in New York, New Jersey, and in Michigan? It, it felt to me, in my experience, being in the hospital system and in the nursing home system, that, and that felt to me, all the, all the focus in the media and everything our former governor was saying was on the hospitals, not on the nursing homes. It, om it felt like nursing homes were the orphan stepchild. There's just, I, I can't put it any other way. And, and yet, the nursing homes are where our most loved people are, our parents, our grandparents. Uh, it, it was it just, nobody with common sense would have ever done anything like that. And, and what, 50 states, uh, 45 states didn't do that, the five that did? From what I remember, and I don't, I don't remember the numbers, the, the outcomes were just so much higher. And, and at a time when we prevented family members from being with those individuals. Thank you so much for your testimony. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you, young lady, for yielding back. Before we close, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record 27 letters the committee has received from individuals and organizations about this crucial issue. Without objection, so ordered. In closing, I want to thank all of today's witnesses for their testimony. We appreciate your insight and expertise as we seek to understand the challenges that America's nursing homes faced during the coronavirus crisis so we can learn from the past and prepare for the future. I also wish to apologize uh, for the outburst we heard here today. When I was leaving home, going away to college back in 1957, my dad shared with me a little anecdote and he concluded with this thought. Now, Sonny said to me, the first sign of a good education is good manners. I've held to that, and it seems to me that a lot of people who went off to college did not get a good education. And so I apologize uh, for what you were subjected to here today. And I'm grateful that the Biden administration is focused on improving nursing homes in America so that the coronavirus and other infectious diseases no longer pose a dangerous threat to residents and staff. Vaccinations, including being up to date on boosters, remain our most important tool in preventing severe outcomes from the coronavirus. Nowhere has the life-saving impact of coronavirus vaccines been more apparent than in our nation's nursing homes. And I am very pleased to hear your testimony here today, Ms. Ramos, on that subject. I urge all Americans to get vaccinated and to go out and get the updated bivalent booster as soon 
as they are eligible. With that, and without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. This hearing is adjourned.